So hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for tuning in to this presentation um, on hybrid manufacturing. Uh, this talk is around hybrid manufacturing and a recent project that ourselves at Autodesk, uh, a team over at Mazak and a team at Seco uh, recently completed uh, to demonstrate that hybrid manufacturing and the solutions for hybrid manufacturing uh, are really ready for industry today. Uh, before we jump into the content of this presentation, we're just going to do a short introduction of ourselves. My name is Rob Bauman. I'm a technical consultant at Autodesk. I'm based in the Fusion 360 product team at Autodesk, and I work on research projects, and I work with industrial partners on developing additive uh, and hybrid manufacturing technologies and applications for industry. Hi everyone, my name is Chris Austin and I'm a hybrid applications engineer at Yamazaki Mazak UK. Um, I'm part of a team where we help develop the hybrid solutions which include the AM side, which uh, is laser powder and wire arc. So the contents of this presentation, we're first going to jump into a bit of introduction to DED, directed energy deposition, which is the technology we use for this project. And we're going to jump into a bit of an introduction for hybrid manufacturing as well. We're going to look at the reasons why customers are interested and are using DED today and hybrid technologies. Chris is going to give a bit of a background to some of Mazak's hybrid manufacturing solutions that are available to the market today. Then we're going to jump into the Bliss demonstration that we've carried out over the past couple of months. We're going to look at the end-to-end -end workflow covering software to hardware, and we're going to think about some of the considerations when we're using a hybrid machine and when we're building a hybrid component. But first, an introduction to the technology. So additive manufacturing in general is made up of seven sub-technologies. These cover all ranges of material, process style, sizes of components you can make. Some that we're more familiar with are uh, that of powder bed fusion technology, where metal powder is melted with either a laser or an electron beam to build an additive component. Or material extrusion, or as it's more commonly known, fused filament fabrication, which is the leading technology used in most desktop 3D printers that people may have at home or have in their offices. Today, we're going to be focusing on the one in the bottom right-hand corner of this image, which is called directed energy deposition. As the name suggests, this is a deposition type of technology. So what that means is we're laying down material selectively, building up single beads of material into layers, and then building up those layers into the slices of the geometry that we're making. This technology comprises of a manipulator that will move the processing head, and that manipulator can either be a gantry uh, or a robotic arm, and that manipulator holds a head which contains a feedstock, which is the material that we're processing. That feedstock is typically either a wire or a powder, and then we are melting that feedstock with an energy source, and that energy source will typically either be a laser, an electron beam, or an electric arc. Now, when we look at this diagram, it looks relatively simple. It doesn't look like there are many additive technologies. But if we dive a bit deeper, we see that there are many variations of these different technologies and lots of subcategories that people have developed over time for different applications, for processing different materials, or for simply trying to make better quality parts or trying to make them faster. And we can see there are a lot of companies under each of these subsections producing machines for these technologies. And as I said, the area that we're focusing on in this diagram is directed energy deposition. Now, we touched on the process a little bit earlier and how it works, but here you can see some images and you can see some video of the actual process. So as mentioned, we have four combinations of this technology. That's either an electron beam coupled with a wire feedstock, an electric arc coupled with a wire feedstock, a laser coupled with a wire feedstock, or a laser coupled with a powder. There are other variations out there, but these are probably four of the most common variations that we see being used in industry, uh, uh, and there are machines available that use these today. Other variations that we can see in the technology, if you look at some of these images, you can see the material is fed from the side of the, of the uh, power source, which is melting the material. And in other configurations, you can see that the material is fed around the power source which is what we call a coaxial system. So comparing DD 
to other metal additive manufacturing technologies. We can see from this graph on the left-hand side that DD is typically used for manufacturing larger components, and this is due to the higher deposition rates of the technology. When we compare it to something like powder bed fusion, powder bed fusion might be consolidating grams of material per hour, whereas in DED, we're more in the range of kilograms of material per hour. And we can see that this ranges from powder to wire. There is a difference between the two and wire enabling us to deposit even more material than that of powder. However, there is a trade-off in this, right? And that trade-off is around the resolution and the complexity of the parts that we can make. So the resolution tends to be poorer for DED and poorer still for the wire variant of the technology. And the resolution, i.e. the smallest feature that we can make, tends to be poorer for DED and poorer again for the wire version of the technology still. However, there are some other advantages that we get with DED that we don't get with technologies such as powder bed fusion. And that's the ability to mount one of these processing heads onto a multi-axis gantry, onto a robot system. And that enables us to deposit material in multiple axes, which in theory means that we can overcome the need for support structures, which are a huge factor in technologies such as powder bed fusion. If we don't have to build support structures, we don't have to remove them or machine them afterwards necessarily. Because this is a deposition type of technology as well, we can also build parts with multiple materials. We don't have a powder bed where we would have to mix multiple powders. We can simply change the material that we're processing through the head in the build. Another advantage that we've got on here is the ability to add additional features to existing stock. So we could take a component that is manufactured in a more traditional method, and we could add on an additional feature or a more complex feature that might be harder to add in the conventional process. Therefore, we can use DED to get that additional detail onto our part. So why are companies interested in this technology today? So at Autodesk and also at Mazak, we've been working in this industry for, for several years now. And the main players that we've been working with are, are companies in these spaces. So companies that are in marine space, in the aerospace, um, in automotive space, in the oil and gas space, and in the heavy industry space. And these tend to be companies that manufacture a vast quantity of components and also a vast quantity of large structures and large components. And there are also industries that have a lot of pressure on them to be more sustainable in the way that they operate and in the way that they manufacture components. And it's really that sustainability which is driving them to new technologies and technologies such as DED for making some of their larger structures and some of their structures from high value um, materials. That sustainability is realized in a few ways. They realize it through shorter production lead times so they can design a component and get to the first testing of that component much quicker. They realize it through reduced materials so they have less waste of high value material or any material really in their process. They also reduce the need to uh, uh, carry spare parts. So if a part fails whilst it's in operation, they don't necessarily need to keep a spare part in a warehouse anymore. They can use DED as a toolless process and a decentralized process to manufacture that part on demand where it's needed. They're using it to improve the performance of their parts, either through redesigning how the part fits into a system or how it functions in a system, or they're adding advanced materials to existing components to improve their performance. They're also looking at how they can decentralize their manufacturing process. So they don't need uh, factories with specific tooling for making specific parts. They can have a toolless process like DED. They can have those distributed globally and they can manufacture the parts where they are needed to reduce their, their carbon footprint of moving parts uh, around the globe. And these are examples of some of those parts that people are making. Some of these are aerospace components, and these components are used to supplement supply chains that exist today. In the aerospace industry, typical lead times for new castings and forgings can stretch into months, sometimes years for some development programs. Whereas with the toolless process like DED, you can potentially get to that first component within a few weeks therefore reducing your development cycle quite heavily. This is also beneficial for supplementing your supply chain should you have an issue in your existing supply chain. We're also seeing examples in marine where companies are looking to reduce spare components. An example of a propeller is prime for taking 
uh, advantage of the benefits of additive manufacturing because this is a component that rarely fails but when it does fail it renders the boat useless and the boat obviously can't go out to sea therefore to mitigate that risk companies keep vast warehouses of stock of these propellers for the day that they might need them but that day rarely comes and therefore you have to keep a huge stock that you might not need if you can manufacture these components on demand that's a much more cost effective way of managing your spare part supply chain we're also seeing companies that are essentially trying to change the way we manufacture things or change the way we think about manufacturing things and they're also reaping the benefits of designing products as well. So in the bottom right-hand corner there, we can see a project from MX3D where they're looking at additively manufacturing a bridge, and that's taking advantage of the new design freedoms this technology has, but also the ability to manufacture this part in situ and even over the canal at some point. We spoke about the advantages of additive and the advantages of directed energy deposition. But what you could see in a number of those images was that the surface finish due to the high deposition rate was relatively poor on a number of these components. So in a range of areas, we actually want to still machine these components, particularly on um, high performance surfaces or surfaces that are mating faces so that we can get that component within the specification of the final part. We can't necessarily achieve that through additive alone. So we need to combine additive with a machining process. And this is how a hybrid process is born. When we take both of those technologies and we integrate them into a single machine, this is when we have a hybrid machine. So when we talk about a hybrid machine, we're talking about an additive manufacturing and a machining process in the same machine. Now, Mazak have been making a range of these machines for, for a number of years now. And Chris is going to talk to us about some of those solutions that Mazak offer. Thanks, Rob. Um, yeah, I just want to give you a, a rundown of Mazak itself. So we're a Japanese family-run company. Uh, we're a global company. Um, I work at HQ in Worcester itself, and we supply the majority of Europe. Um, we have a vast, extensive product range. Uh, we'll make things from very simple three-axis lathes to machining centers, multi-axis lathes, live tooling in, the complex five-axis machining centers, your verticals, your horizontals. We can do laser processing. We've got automation solutions. And obviously what we're talking about today is our hybrid solutions. So as Rob talked about, the hybrid system itself is you're putting two things into the one machine. So in this case, we're adding the AM and the SM, as we call it, the subtractive side of it, into one machine. So obviously Rob, what Rob's been talking about is people have been doing this for years, so AM-wise, people have been adding material, but it's a big thing then to having to put it into a machine to then finish it to tolerances. So with our machines, the idea is that it's all done in situ, so it's all relevant to each other. It can all be machined and added at the same time. So the machines we're looking at here in particular, we've got a laser powder in the bottom left here. So this was a demo we did a show a few years back now, just to give you an idea. So as Rob talked about earlier, this is powder fed. So we're using a laser beam to create the melt pool. We're then feeding material into that melt pool and then creating our clads. So with this, we can make our multi-material parts. It's very popular with coatings, so certainly very hard coatings. You can take quite a cheap substrate of material, like a mild steel, and then we can add much tougher materials such as tungsten carbides or stellites, um, or even heat-resistant materials like your ink canals and things like that. So we have a few different versions of the laser powder side, depending on customer needs. And then on the right-hand side, we have the wire arc system. So effectively, it's MIG welding. Again, it's all in the same machine, so we can quite easily change from the AM to the SM. With the wire arc side of it all, as Rob pointed out, it's much quicker being able to put the material down obviously resolution you do start losing but for the industries at the moment the wire arc certainly lends itself to the much bigger parts and the much the higher value materials so we can get that material down quite quickly and we can then machine it back to the tolerances so we're saving a lot of time in tooling and material wise okay great thanks chris so what Chris has spoken about there, 
are all the machines that are available to purchase and are available to an end user today. But really, a hybrid solution isn't just the machine. It's fantastic having a very robust, reliable machine, but you need software that you can couple with that machine to be able to drive it and get a positive hybrid experience and get good components out the end of that machine. At Autodesk, we have software solutions that enable you to do that through Fusion 360 um, and our PowerMill software. But you also need to couple the process with good tooling as well. And this is where Seco have extremely good tooling for cutting the kind of very specific requirements of deposited metals and giving you long life in your tooling and also giving you good finish on your components. And really, it's not enough to just have one of these elements or a couple of these elements, but you need all of them. And this is where collaboration in the supply chain and collaboration with partners is key. So really, this component that we're showing in this presentation wouldn't have come together so nicely without this collaboration between all of us. The final point to make here is that this technology is ready now, really. So you can go and purchase these machines, you can go and get yourself the software, and you can go and get yourself the good tooling today. But really, you need to have all three elements to be successful. So to demonstrate that collaboration, we decided to come up with a project that would demonstrate the benefits of hybrid manufacturing on a relatively complex component, which is seen as something that's quite difficult to do with, do with hybrid manufacturing today. And we chose this BLISC component. So if you don't know what a BLISC is, a BLISC is a turbo machinery component, and it comprises of a rotor disc in the center and blades around that but they are a single component. This isn't an assembly of parts. They are a single piece of material. The material we've used for this demonstration is a nickel super alloy, and we've used two variants of nickel super alloy. We've used Inconel 625 for the blades, and we've started with a hub of Inconel 718. Uh, the size of that, it's roughly around 350 millimeters in diameter. You can see there, we've got the model of a central hub, and there are 20 Inconel 625 blades around that. And this is targeting industries such as aerospace and power generation. The machine we've used for this is the wire arc machine that Chris was showing us before, the Variaxis J600AM. And conventionally, this part would be forged or cast, and then it would be milled into the final shape, and then perhaps it would be polished depending on the finish that the blades required. So this was the workflow that we tried to follow for this project. And very simple from left to right, we took the CAD design that we had, uh, we recreated some new surfaces, um, um, adding some stock on so that we had the deposition model we needed to create. We then programmed some tool paths for the additive process. We did some process simulation. We then created the subtractive tool paths to remove the material to get us to the final part. We did some machine simulation to look at the machine kinematics. Then we created our NC program where we ordered all of these tool paths together, and then we went to the machine to, to, to build this part. And we'll dive into each of these areas now in a, in a little bit more detail. So the first stage, once we've got our CAD, is to examine that CAD to make sure it's good, make sure we've got no holes in our component, uh, make sure we've got all the surfaces that we're going to need to be able to build this part. And then once we've done that, we need to create what we call the deposition model. Now, the deposition model is the model that represents the material deposition that we're going to carry out in the additive process. And this is really an offset of the final geometry so we add additional stock onto our final geometry, and we also remove features that we know we're not going to be able to build through the additive process. Now, at the moment today, this is purely taken from experience. So you must know that if you can't build certain overhangs or certain holes or features, and then you need to remove them from your model. Once we've done that, we add on the stock to our, to our final geometry. And that's a little bit of an unknown as well. So when we're building the component for the first time, we might add on a nominal stock, but we might come back later to change and adjust that stock to optimize it for the process. Once we've taken that deposition model that we've created from Fusion 360, we bring it into PowerMill. And PowerMill is where we create our tool paths for the additive process. Now in PowerMill, we have the ability to create a number of different tool paths in different styles using our PowerMill additive capability. But the one that we've chosen for this product is a medial axis toolpath, which you can see in the top left-hand corner here. Now, this is a toolpath that follows the curvature of the blade, and that twists, obviously, as the blade is built up. 
This gives us nice long weld segments. So we're trying to minimize the start and stop of the process to try and achieve a nice steady process and a good bead shape. Now it's not enough to have those good tool paths. We also need to control the angle of the tool because this is quite a thin and tall component, we don't want the melt pool falling off the side of the blade. So by controlling the angle of the tool, we can ensure that we get a good bead of deposition on top of the previous layer and that it doesn't fall off the side of the part. Now we can do this quite easily in Power Mill. We have extensive editing tools and we have the ability to edit the tool axis of each of the segments of, of deposition. And what you can see in that bottom left-hand corner is the tool axis for each pass and how that is actually pointing inwards to the blade so that we can ensure we get that, that good bead shape and good deposition. Once we've got our tool path and we're happy with it, we can bring that tool path, we can keep that tool path, sorry, in power mill and we can bring in our machine tool and we can do some kinematic simulation. So this is a representation you can see in the bottom right hand corner of the machine tool we were using with the deposition head in place. And we're seeing the machine running along the tool path that we're creating. And what we're looking for here are any instances where the machine might collide with the part that we're building or collide with another part of the machine. So this will give us some level of confidence that actually we're gonna have a relatively safe process when we, when we come, to the, come to the machine itself. Once we have created that additive toolpath and, and we're happy with it, what we did next is we took that toolpath and we brought it into our NetFab simulation package. Now this enables us to simulate the deposition, simulate the additive process, and we are building this into every single part that we make. This for us is a very critical step in the additive workflow, in the DED workflow that, that, that we're undertaking. And we can do a couple of things here. We can do a thermal simulation which will simulate the heat buildup in the component. And that will tell us if we're putting too much heat into the part and maybe we need to stop and let the part cool down. And it will show us the distribution of heat throughout the component. So if we're putting too much heat into one area of the component, we can move to perhaps another area and start building up material there so we get a nice even distribution. Once we've done that thermal simulation, we can then go on to do a mechanical simulation. And the mechanical simulation will show us the stress in the component as we build it. And from that stress, it will predict distortion. So we can see how the part will change in shape as it heats and cools through the building of the layers. Now this is critical because we need to machine this part afterwards. We need to ensure that we can machine it back to a final geometry which is that of the part that we, we designed. So we can take this additive process simulation data and we can go back to our tool path planning stage to alter our tool paths, perhaps the order of them to distribute heat, or we can go even further back and we can go to the design phase so that we can alter the stock that we've put onto our blades. Perhaps our blade is distorted so much that we need to put additional stock onto the blade to make sure that we can machine it back to the, to the final geometry. And then we go on to the machine and Chris is going to talk a little bit about the AM process that he experienced when building this part. So taking from what Rob said from the simulations, it's all very well. Once you get on the machine, there'll be a lot more variables that the simulation won't be able to take into account. Um, as we started building, we can then see if we're still adding a bit too much power. As Rob was saying with the axis, we've got to make sure that that clad is building properly and we're not getting too much heat that starts spilling over the side. From that, as it is, it's quite easy. Then you go back into power mill, you can make your adjustments. From what we also found from the simulations as well is that to have all 20 blades, you are unable to build one at a time one for the room mainly, but also for the heat dissipation. So it actually helped us better to then build each blade bit by bit, almost going opposite sides of the hub. That way we had all the access we need for the torch, but it also helped with the heat as well. And we were seeing that the blades were forming really nicely as we were building up. The beads were nice and level and it worked really, really well. After this, because it did go so well, we can actually then go back to the beginning stage of what Rob was talking about, back into fusion, and we can actually start reducing the amount of stock that we needed. So from initially, we, as Rob pointed out, you will, you'll put a maximum amount, and then until you start machining, you'll then work out how much less you can get away with. 
we did obviously learn at that point, which is when we can go back to Fusion, we can make adjustments back into Power Mill, uh, which works really, really well. So yeah, each of the blades, the Inconel 625, so this material lends itself really well to the welding. It can cope with the heat quite well. Uh, the one problem with this is the machining time of it, which is why this process is very good because one material is very expensive and it takes a long time to cut. If you're trying to cut this from a solid hub, the time and the tooling can be quite expensive. But using it this way, we've saved a lot of time and a lot of material. Great. So once we had created the additive tool path and we were happy with the deposition that we had put down, we obviously need to machine this part to get it to its final geometry. Now we use power mill again to create the machining tool paths and in power mill we have specific tool paths for machining bliss, machining blade components. This enables us to do the roughing if we were starting with a casting or forging. But in our case, it enabled us to go straight to the finishing of that blade as well. It also enables us to finish the hub at the bottom of the, at the root of the blade also. Now these specific tool paths are extremely useful because of the complex nature of blisk geometry. So not only do we want to consider the blade that we're machining at the moment, but we need to consider the two blades either side so that we don't have any nasty collisions or gouges with those two components. We can also in Power Mill accurately model the excellent tooling that we have from Seco, which you can see in the bottom left-hand corner. And this gave us a very detailed representation, accurate representation of the levels of clearance that we had between the blades during the milling process. And again, you can see at the top there, the kinematic simulation of the machine moving around the blade, taking the material off that we can do within software. And this will identify any collisions that we see between the parts and the machine or with the machine with itself or any gouges that the tool may take from other blades in the assembly of the blades. So once we're happy with this tool path, uh, we can go back to the machine to, to, to cut our final part, which Chris is going to explain his experiences of uh, now. Thanks, Rob. So, yeah, as Rob said, once you've got those tool paths, it's very, very easy to go back and fine tune them. So it's only once that tool pass created, if you can see in the demo, the bottom right, the table gets very close to the spindle. So it's very important, it's obviously the simulations, but you've got that edit functionality where you can start limit spindles, change axis. So you can still get the geometry that you require, but keeping the machine in safe positions. Another very important thing for us was the gouge and the collisions because in a perfect world without machining, that's machining a blade realizing that there's no stock on the others. So within that collision avoidance, we can tell it that the stock is actually there and then it can compensate itself, but also work out if you're going to start getting gouges and collisions. Because of that, we then found out we actually had to then machine the blades in parts. So it just meant that the first 20 or 30 mil we would machine off each blade and then come down in three steps to the point then once we're machining the hub, we got full clearance, no collisions, no gouges, and it machined it really, really well. So the tooling we're using is a bull nose skin, really nice finish, but there's many different tooling you can use to speed up the process. I know Seco have a lovely array of tools with all sorts of fancy coatings for this type of material especially. But for what we've got, the finish we're very happy with and the geometry was pretty much spot on to our model, so we were very happy. So at the start of this demonstration, we showed that the workflow was quite linear from taking a design component, going through to programming the tool paths, doing some process simulation, doing some kinematic simulation, and then going to the machine. But in reality, that's not really how the workflow realizes itself. In reality, there are a number of loops in this workflow where we learn something new and we go back to a previous step to make adjustments. So examples of that are when we're doing the additive tool pass planning stage, we need to think about, do we have access for the deposition head? So will the welder be able to get into the component to build the blade? Or is it going to crash with either a part of the machine or another part of the component that we've just built? And what this leads to is a decision on, do we need to deposit an entire blade at a time? Or do we need to deposit each blade in a number of layers and distribute the building throughout the component? 
once we have an idea of how we're going to do that and we can only realize that through things like process simulation we can either go back to the design for manufacture stage to maybe change our geometry add less stock or maybe add more stock in certain areas and we need to take that information forward to when we come to the nc program creation phase to order our tool paths in an order that's going to allow us the access that we need if we look at the additive process simulation stage, we're looking at things like overheating of the part. Is the blade overheating or are we overheating the component in a certain area? And we need to look at distortion. So once we've built the blade, does it distort too far that it won't machine back? And with that information, we can either go back to the additive toolpath planning stage or further back to the design for manufacture stage where potentially we need to add more stock into the region where, the, where our part won't clean up. We can also carry that information forward to the NC program creation phase so that we can distribute heat around the part by changing the order of the additive toolpath. So if we look at the subtractive toolpath planning phase, again, we're interested in tool access. So is our tool gonna to be able to access the entire blade to finish it? And that informs our decision on do we machine an entire blade in one go or do we need to machine the blade in stages? which means we need to interleave the additive process with the machining process, i.e. we build a little bit of the blade and then we machine a bit of it. We build a little bit more and we machine a bit more. So knowing the information around the kinematics of the machine and being able to do the simulation will inform that decision of whether we can reach every part of the blade to, to finish it. And really we carry that information forwards to the NC creation phase of, of our workflow. And when we get to the machine simulation, we're looking for things like machine collisions. Is the machine colliding with itself? Is the tool colliding with the part or making gouges? Or are we reaching kinematic limits of the machine? Which means actually, if we post-process that program, we won't see on the machine what we're expecting to see. And with this information, we can kind of go either way. We can go back to the toolpath planning stage, or we can go forward to the NC creation phase uh, to inform how we order our toolpaths again. So that brings us to the end of our presentation. And really, as a summary, the points that we're trying to get across here is that expert knowledge and tools are required to have a successful experience with hybrid and create successful hybrid parts. And tools covers everything from the hardware to the software to the actual tooling that you put in your machine. And you require expert knowledge at each of those stages to make this process work at the moment. Our sales at Autodesk and Mazak and Seco offer industry leading solutions in each of these areas. And this is technology that's ready today, it's accessible, and you can come and collaborate with us and we will take you through how to make successful hybrid components. But really that collaboration is key and having good collaboration across that chain of machine to software to tooling is very key to have a successful hybrid experience and make successful hybrid components. So thank you for watching. We're gonna end with a short video that we made on this project. If you would like to go and see the entire five minute long video, please go and visit our YouTube channel, um, Autodesk Advanced Manufacturing. Uh, but again, thanks for watching. I hope this was informative and we'll see you all soon.